then eventually it will also be, there it is, um, it'll also be um, on our website blog um, soon as well. Um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, put your name, your organization or your farm, where you're calling in from and what you produce. Um, and if you think of any questions during the webinar, please feel free to throw them in the chat um, and we'll be collecting those questions um, to get those asked during our Q&A moment. Um, if you're new to RAFI and the Farmers of Color Network, um, by way of a quick introduction, RAFI is a Rural Advancement Foundation International USA. Our mission is to challenge the root causes of an unjust food system. Uh, we support and advocate for economically, racially, and ecologically just farm communities. Um, we manifest this mission through a number of programs, one of which is the Farmers of Color Network. Um, the Farmers of Color Network uh, has been in existence since 2017. Uh, we work to, de to develop relationships with farmers of color in order to support and honor multi-generational organizing, sustainable agricultural practices, ancestral traditions, and also knowledge. Um, we provide farmer-led technical assistance. We offer funding opportunities. We host networking events, um, now more so that COVID is um, dying down, um, <clears throat> and also gatherings like this to expand market access for farmers in our network. If you are interested in joining the network, um, you can go to our website where you can learn more about the network, learn more about membership, and also sign up for our newsletter. Uh, the two links that I have on the screen are the same. The bit.ly is just the shorter version of the longer one that's, that's, um, that's below. Um, and we will, I'll send you all these things as well after the webinar along with the recording. So um, as I said previously, this is, a, uh, this is the second uh, webinar in a five-part series on market readiness. And so I'm saying this so you would be aware that we have three more of these coming up um, in the summer and the fall. So be on the lookout for for those, those will deal with farm to school institutional buying, um, how to become a SNAP EBT ret retailer, and working within a collective or a collaborative. Um, so you can look for that on our social media or in our newsletter. And one last plug for a project of RAFI. Um, uh, we have a project called the Resources for Resilient Farms. Um, and this project is basically offering one-on-one -on -one -on -one technical assistance um, for farm agent, excuse me, for farm service agency FSA. Um, disaster relief programs, um, COVID relief programs for socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers within the network. Um, this is also not limited just to disaster programs. This could be if you're interested in learning what, you know, how and why to get a farm number, how do you work with your FSA office and your FSA agent, any of those questions you might have, um, you can come to us and you can reach us through an email, uh, resources for resilient farms at graphusa.org or through our hotline number, which you see on the screen which again, I will also send to you um, in, in an email later. Or you can go to our website and fill out an intake form and someone from the team will get back to you. So without further ado, um, I'll start our, present, our, um, our webinar. Um, we have with us Kim Butts, who is a food safety specialist. And just to give you an overview of the evening, um, Kim is gonna present a wealth of knowledge on food safety you know, regarding GAP and organic. And then we're gonna have two farmers, um, GAP and organic certified respectively to talk about their um, experiences. So first we'll have Kim, who is the South Carolina Local Produce Safety Coordinator at Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. Uh, Kim has a passion for all things food and farming. Uh, she focuses on teaching farmers about the importance of food safety while supporting them throughout their GAP certification processes. Her, her education, training, and experience have been in sustainable and organic, and organic farming practices. She grew up submerged in architecture, or excuse me, architecture, agriculture, has 25 years in food service experience, and has managed a 90 acre diversified um, produce farm, and has taught food safety on and off for the last 12 years. Um, in her role at CFSA, Kim provides uh, training and technical assistance to operators of diversified farms. She helps farmers to be prepared and successful in an audit and inspection for those using and seeking USDA GAP or good, ag good agricultural practices. Uh, good handling practices, harmonized gap certification, and FDA produce, produce safety rule. So thank you, Kim, for joining us. And I'll stop sharing so you can share your presentation now. We'll do that. Thank you for the introduction, Nikki, and thank you for having me tonight. Um, this is really awesome. It looks like we have um, a, a great crew tonight. So welcome, everybody, to um, the second part of this. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about 
um, a little bit about who who Carolina Farm Stewardship Association is. So um, we are a farmer driven membership based nonprofit, and and like Nikki said, we support um, you know farming. Uh, that's good for consumers and our farmers and our farm workers and and you know good for the land. So our mission is um, to help people in the Carolinas grow and eat local organic food by um, advocating for fair farm and food policies, uh, building the systems that um, organic family farms need to thrive, and educating communities about um, local organic and sustainable farming. So I am part of our farm services team. Um, and the farm services team consists of uh, food safety, organic certification. Uh, we are um, a big player in food councils and advocacy, um, conservation activity plans. And uh, we have an expert on staff in Gina um, who, who helps with our high time production. So a lot of what we do and a lot of what we provide is help and support in those specific areas. So. Um, you know, I, we do a lot of one on one consulting services. Um, my portion of this, the food safety portion of it, um, there is a, a team of three of us now between North and South Carolina. So um, Keisha and Mary have just recently joined. Um, we come out to the farms, um, provide those one on one consulting services, kind of see where you're at when you have an interest in, in, in moving forward in either food safety or even in GAP certification. Some people just use our services for getting that food safety plan started. Uh, so we have templates that we work with your farm, tailor them to fit whatever it is that you are doing and, and get those plans in place. Um, we have all the record templates, which would satisfy um, you know, FISMA if you would be a covered farm. Um, or all the record templates that would be required of GAP, which is a USDA program. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, we have all the risk assessments that go along with um, what is required for GAP. We have checklists that we use for success. Um, we help you get all of your state and federal forms filled out and completed and submitted appropriately. Um, we help with all the cost share information between uh, the different states, North and South Carolina. I see there's some some people here from Maryland, so um, we would be we'd be happy to help you know support that um, and get you into in touch with people who would be able to help. Um, and then also water testing information and guidance. So there are cost share applications in both North and South Carolina for water quality testing. Um, how to you know guidance on how that needs to be done. Um, based on on the risk assessments. So kind of get into GAP and give a brief overview of what GAP is. Um, you know, what does it take to get certified? There are a lot of things that circulate around, um, you know, when it comes to GAP, you know, that, it, oh gosh, it's going to be so hard and, oh gosh, it's going to be so expensive and, you know, I'm never going to be able to do this and, and trust me. Um, I, I've worked with lots of farms, both um, in the Carolinas, uh, as well as in Pennsylvania, and everyone can do it. So I'm not going to say it's painless, but, um, but it's absolutely doable. So what are GAPs? Um, it's the guidance that produce growers can use to prevent um, on-farm on contamination of fruits and vegetables. It was developed um, by the USDA in 1985. It's a voluntary program, um, although now most buyers are requiring it. Uh, when I say most buyers, I say most large buyers, um, many of your grocery store chains, many of your um, institutional um, food services, um, you know, a lot of your wholesale buyers, your Fresh Points, your Cisco's, your, um, you know, your uh, food, um, food, I'm trying to think of the JP Foods is who it used to be, um, you know, they're all looking for some type of third party audit um, verification. So although it's voluntary, um, like I said, nine times out of 10, if you're getting into the wholesale avenue or going direct to some of these institutions, it's pretty much required. Um, it can protect your farm business from the economic consequences of food contamination. Um, and one of the things that I, I say all the time, um, it's focused on prevention of contamination rather than remediation. So, you know, everybody sees the, 
the outbreaks of, you know, romaine and onions. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So the, the focus of this is to, to put systems in place um, for that remediation rather than, um, I mean, for prevention rather than having to jump through the hoops after the fact, after we get someone sick. So why would you get GAP certified? I get this all the time. You know, well, my buyer is not requiring it. So why would I get certified? So you can use it as a marketing tool. Um, and it is a nice marketing tool, especially for people who are trying to get into some of those institutional or, you know, retail markets. Um, it does open a lot of doors. So, you know, when you have that uh, GAP certification, that's saying to, you know, to your potential buyers, hey, I, you know, I've done everything I can on my farm to put out a product that's quality and that's as safe as I can, I can make it based on the standards. Um, it also provides customer reassurance, you know, even if you're using it as a, mar as a piece for, you know, a, a farmer's market, um, roadside stands, you know, I met with a group this morning um, and, and they're forming a cooperative and, you know, some of them have just, you know, stands on the farm and they say, you know, a lot of times we get beach traffic or we get lake traffic and they, you know, they do the turnaround and they look um, and, and quite often they said they do get questions regarding you know, what is, what is the quality? What are our food safety practices? Um, so uh, there's that, and then it shows good intent. I mean, it shows that you wanna do the right thing um, and it's real important. It's real important for food safety. So when we're looking at costs, that's usually one of the first things that people ask me when they call or one of the first things they ask when um, they put in their cost share application is how much is this gonna cost me? So um, real quick, in a nutshell, anywhere from $800 to $1,400 per year. And that depends on what you're doing as far as scope is concerned. So when we start with the hourly rate, we're looking at $115 per hour. Um, you know, when we're looking at cost shares, if we're talking about strictly North and South Carolina, and every state has their own, some have more, some have less. Uh, when we're looking at South Carolina, we're looking at $750 on your first year. Uh, when we're looking at North Carolina, we're looking at $900 on your first year. And then for both um, North and South Carolina, $300 thereafter. So how do these charges add up? So it's the clock starts from the time that the auditor leaves their, um, their residence um, or their hub and gets to your farm. So that's a round trip total. You can look at typically on the farm, um, you know, two hours of time on the farm for audit based on whatever scope that you're interested in, in doing. And then, you know, another maybe half hour, hour of administration time. I put two here because I always put the max versus the least. So we're pleasantly surprised instead of frustrated at the end if it's a little bit more. Um, and then we're looking at USDA, they do a review. So to back it up a little bit, um, the program is obviously USDA, but the state departments of ag are the ones who actually do the inspections in most cases. So I've, I've done um, audits in Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, um, and it's always been the Department of Ag. So they do it on behalf of the USDA. So when you see this, um, you know, audit costs, what they average depending on where you are from either the hub um, of, of Columbia for South Carolina or the auditor's home base in North Carolina, you know, you can kind of look at, at, look at it from that vantage point and kind of get an idea how much it will be. Um, and then you get two bills. Uh, one is from the state and one is from the USDA. Um, the, administrative, the administrative time for the USBA is that two to four hours, depending, uh, you know, I can tell you that it's typically three hours. They review the state um, documentation, they create the certificates, they upload it to their website, and they give ultimately the final approval on your audit. GAP audits, um, I talk about these scopes. Um, there are a couple different ways that we can do this, um, a couple different types of audits. So we have this um, GAP GIP audit, which is uh, a very entry level um, audit. Uh, the reason I don't push it or give too much information on it 
is that most buyers at this point don't accept it. Um, it is, it was the original gap gap audit. Um, we moved into a standard um, harmonized scope uh, a few years back. And now most buyers are requiring that you're in the harmonized standard. So happy to do the gap gap. Um, if that's all your buyer is requiring, we absolutely support that. You can pick and choose which parts you want to, um, to audit to. Uh, that's kind of the nice part about it. You can pick your pieces. Um, when we moved into the when we move into the harmonized gap scopes, um, we have a couple different options. We have uh, field harvest, we have post harvest, and then we have field and post harvest. So, if you don't have a pack house, we're going to do field harvest only. Um, if you have just a pack house and you're a packing facility, we would only obviously do post. If you have both, we would do um, field and post. And this is really driven by the buyer. Um, the buyer tells you what they want um, and what they'd like to see. Um, and then we, we prepare according to what they're, they're asking. We also have this HGAP Plus, which is a GFSI equivalency. So um, what does that mean? Um, GFSI is the Glo Global Food Safety Initiative. They're the ones that kind of make all the rules when it comes to uh, food safety. Um, it's an equivalency. That does not mean it is equal to or it's equivalent to. Um, will Walmart accept it? No. Um, will many of your large uh, buyers accept it? Yes. Um, and many of the larger buyers are actually looking for you to move into that age gap plus scope. So where I come in, a lot of times we start people in harmonized gap. Year one, year two, by year three, we're up into that age gap. Plus. So, you know, again, and I've mentioned it prior, like, what does your buyer require? Uh, this is very important. So, you know, de depending on scope, and you'd be surprised how many times I, I get from, you know, a farmer, well, you know, I just need gap. Well, we need, we need to know <laughs> which gap we need to do. We wouldn't want to go all the way to audit and, and audit to find out that, oh, you know, the buyer actually required that I did this. Um, uh, oftentimes I'll get that phone call and we'll get through the process and then we'll hang up and, you know, a day or two will go by and I'll get the phone call that says, hey, Kim, I checked with the buyer. We have to do this instead of this. So real important um, to kind of know where, which direction we're heading. Um, and then, you know, one of the questions I get is, you know, why? You know, which one do I pick? What do I need to do to protect my farm, um, my customers, and be compliant with current regulations? So first thing we need to do is, is basically, um, you know, assess your on-farm risk. So when you call me um, or you are looking to, to go to audit, you know, some of the things that you really need to start with are these risk assessments. And then, then we base your food safety plan on the, the outcomes of these risk assessments. They are part of the harmonized gap standard. They are required um, to be done and completed. So we have land, water, soil amendments, pack house, site security, um, animals, both domestic and wildlife, allergens. And if we're in any type of post-harvest operation, um, the produce washing techniques. So, you know, the threat of contamination in our fresh produce is real and it's an important concern for everyone. Um, it's important for our growers and our wholesalers and our retailers and consumers and now governments involved. They've been involved, um, but now even more so, uh, especially with FISMA, uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act and the Produce Safety Rule, where, you know, they are now, instead of a voluntary program in GAP, it is a mandatory, um, a mandatory program if you are a covered farm. We only have an hour and a half tonight, so we won't get into too much of that, but um, I can absolutely help you uh, through that process if you're not sure if you would be a covered farm. It's um, based on annual sales and an average of three years. So millions of people worldwide are affected by foodborne illness every year. Um, 48 million get sick, 128,000 are hospitalized and 3,000 year die. I mean, that's a pretty big number. Um, which is why there's such a focus. 
So when we talk about pathogens, they're pretty much everywhere. So, you know, you think about the soil, uh, you think about our hands, you think about, you know, our cell phones that we take everywhere. Pathogens are pretty much everywhere. Some of our big players on the farm uh, would be E. coli, Listeria, and Salmonella. Those are pretty much the big players, the ones that we want to try and prevent. We definitely would not want to have any type of, of outbreak on the farm where any of these three are con uh, concerned. So we're building our basically our, pol our policies, our procedures, and our food safety plan um, to, to mitigate those risks. So, you know, where do we start? We basically start with, you know, building that food safety plan. Um, we have an organized binder that has all of your SOPs. So when you're working with me, those standard operating procedures are something that I help you write to your farm. Uh, we define management responsibilities. Um, we set up all of your records. We complete those risk assessments I talked about. Um, you know, we get some food safety training. So when we're talking about food safety training, uh, the person who is respon responsible, the management um, or the supervisor um, in charge has to have food safety training. And then our employees or our volunteers, they also have to have basic food safety training. So when I say basic, I'm talking about hand washing, I'm talking about personal health and hygiene, I'm talking about you know, the basics of food safety. We do a self audit, uh, which is basically the exact same audit that the um, departments, state departments of ag use to complete their audit. So it gives us, um, you know, typically this is done uh, at the end of, uh, of the road, about a week before we're ready to go to audit to assure that we have covered everything and we're ready. So, you know, one of the things I will never take anybody to audit if they're not 100% ready to go. And then any of the SDS sheets that are associated with any of the chemicals on the farm. So some of us use organic practices, some of us use conventional practices, some of us use different sanitizers. Um, we have to have those SDS sheets, safety data sheets um, with all of the chemicals that we are using. One of the biggest areas for food safety is water. Um, you know, it, it is where the introduction of pathogens often happens when you hear about many of these, um, you know, these outbreaks. It typically comes from the irrigation water and the methods in which they use. So, you know, when we're looking at what we're using, all are okay and acceptable. Um, we just have to, to uh, plan accordingly, test accordingly. And, you know, when we're looking at risk, we're looking at um, the highest risk would be surface water. Obviously, it's open to, um, you know, it's open to the, el the elements, it's open to wildlife. Um, there's fish and, you know, turtles and all that good stuff. So um, surface water would be the highest, well water, um, and surface water we would test three times per year. Uh, well water is an annual test, and then municipal water um, we would download a certificate on a yearly basis. So if it's municipal, it's supposed to be potable and it is supposed to be, um, you know, of, of potable quality. Um, you'd be surprised how many we test that don't have great quality. Um, so testing your water, you know, we would test those sources. Uh, you know, we would sterilize, uh, use sterilized bottles. Um, we'd take our samples, we'd put it on ice and we'd ship it overnight. And I help you get through, or my, my crew helps us help you get through, you know, getting those samples done and sent off. Um, we work with lots of different labs between the Carolinas um, that are accredited. Uh, they have to have um, GLP, which is good lab practices, and we have to verify that with their certifications. When we're talking about potable water, um, there needs to be a potable water source on site, um, you know, What's the difference? Well, potable water is drinking water. So by EPA, uh, EPA uh, drinking water standards, it has to be free of um, generic E. coli and free of uh, total coliform. And we need that for cleaning and sanitizing all of our food contact surfaces. Uh, we need it for drinking and we need it for any of our post-harvest product washing. So real important. 
So when we have, um, you know, we can absolutely use surface water for irrigation, but it is not anything that we could use for a potable water source. Same thing for our well. If we only have a well on the farm, if it is not potable, um, we would have to have a potable water supply um, either brought in um, or have a municipal. If you have both, fantastic. Um, if not, you know, we have to kind of jump through that hurdle. We talked about training your employees, you know, again, the, the management of the food, you know, of the farm who would be responsible for the food safety plan is trained to one level. Um, that can be like a gap 101 training like we're doing tonight, um, a little bit more um, extensive, usually, you know, a four to six hour training. Um, it could be one of the PSA grower trainings, which if you are covered under the produce safety rule is a requirement. Um, it's, a, it's a good eight hour course that gives you pretty in-depth knowledge on many of the, the areas that we're kind of skimming through here tonight. Um, and then this would be your employee training, health and hygiene, proper hand washing, food safety, proper product handling. Um, one of the newer ones that came about last year uh, was site security. Um, and this is looking at the potential for somebody to do harm. So a disgruntled employee, um, you know, somebody who, you know, somebody who just, you know, wants to do harm. Um, a lot of times people are like, oh, I'm such a small farm. That seems kind of silly. And I agree. Um, there are some, some of these uh, standards that seem very silly to a small farm. But if we take a, a step back and we kind of look at it, it's a, a harmonized and standardized, um, you know, uh, audit across the board. So what they're typically capturing is um, the really large farms. Like we're looking at this from across the country. So, you know, we're looking at those thousands and thousands of acres in California where this site security would be a big deal in a warehouse where we're, you know, we have, uh, you know, thousands of square feet and that is going out into the supply chain. So not so much here, but, but definitely uh, in the small farm, but definitely in the larger. And in order to capture everything, we use that harmonized standard. And then chemical application and handling. And one of the most important things, you know, as we've all learned through COVID, um, you know, hands are a food contact surface and, and you know, good and proper hand washing um, really cuts down on the amount of transmission. Um, and I think I've kind of, you know, I think I've touched base on this quite, quite well. Just, you know, personnel with supervisory food safety responsibilities, responsibilities shall receive training sufficient to their responsibilities and, and what that entails. Um, people all say to me, well, I went to a training like three or four years ago. The standard says you really only have to go one time. Um, does the auditor agree with that? Usually not. Um, they recommend um, and like to see and prefer to see every two years. Um, when we're looking at what are we, look, you know, what are some of the some of the risks? Obviously, uh, you know, what's in your soil. So we're taking a look at your fertilizers, your compost. Uh, we want to see your treatment records throughout um, production. Doesn't mean we can't use manure. Doesn't mean we can't use compost. Um, obviously, we're using fertilizers um, in many applications. We just have to keep records of, of what we're putting into the ground. So if we're using raw or untreated amendments, obviously our risk goes up. Um, can we use them? Yes, we just have to do so responsibly. So on our farm, you know, we used uh, we used chicken litter, um, we used mushroom compost, um, you know, and it was not treated. It wasn't treated, at least it wasn't treated to, you know, a level where we could say it was treated. Uh, so we just have to do a little bit of planning. So what does that mean? That means that you know, if we're incorporating it, it has to be, you know, incorporated to reduce risk of, of runoff and cross-contamination. Um, we need to make sure that we wait two weeks to plant. If it's coming in contact with um, the ground and not the edible portion of the crop, we want to wait 90 days to harvest. And if it is coming in contact with the edible portion of the plant, we have to wait 120 days. So for most people, that just means, you know, we back it up a month or two. Um, think about what we're planning, uh, planting, 
think about our successions, think about our days to harvest and plan accordingly. And we help or can help with all of that. Talk about those chemicals, um, you know, the label is the law. Uh, if you're using any type of restricted chemicals in conventional farming, you have to have a current pesticide license. We wanna keep our training logs to make sure that our employees are safe and you're safe. We wanna provide the proper PPE. We wanna have secured storage, proper signage, the application records we talked about, and those safety data sheets, real important. Approved suppliers, um, this is a big area. Um, we wanna make sure that our suppliers where we're, we're getting our products from are uh, reputable, that we've vetted them, that they're food safe and that they're verified clean. So what does that mean? Uh, that means that there are a lot of times that we can pick up uh, packaging that is sometimes used, sometimes stored outside, sometimes stored in areas where it's a little bit questionable and we receive packaging um, that has, you know, rodent dirt and urine, um, bird droppings, um, dirty, dusty, um, have been stored outside in the elements, so actually have mold and mildew. Um, and again, this is big picture, uh, United States. Um, we wanna make sure that we're not accepting products um, that our that our suppliers are reputable, and we're we're getting our packaging in, um, and it's intended for food. Uh, there are a lot of products that are not intended for food, and people are using them and don't realize the potential um, with with using those that type of packaging. I always say, look at it as a food contact surface. Um, you're putting food in it, so. You know, if it's got bird droppings on it and or it has mold on it and or it, you know, is is contaminated with, um, you know, fecal matter from from rats or, or mice, um, you don't want to put in your leafy greens into the box and send it off to your customers. Uh, traceability, um, real big piece of this um, and an area where we do a lot of focus. You need to be able to trace your product back one step from the field and forward one step to the buyer. Um, we do that by giving it an identifier, a date in which you harvest, and then which field it came out of. Um, and, you know, like I said, this is real high level. We're just kind of skipping over the top of this when we work together um, or you're putting together your plan. Uh, this is an area where we would we would kind of spend a little bit of time because the importance of this is that in the event there's a recall, um, we would be able to get all of the affected product back um, and out of uh, the, the consumer mainstream so that no, no further illnesses or um, contamination can happen. We do this with a mock recall. Um, we have to do that annually. Um, it's just the part of running through the process. Um, we have a template that we use um, and, and you work with your buyers, letting them know it's a traceability exercise. We do it annually. Um, we complete it pretty simple. Animals, um, you know, <laughs> there's always animals on the farm. We have domestic and the cats and the dogs. Um, they're allowed. People are like, oh gosh, I'm not gonna be able to have cats or dogs. Sure they are. They just have to be kept out of fields and production areas. So. That means they can't be running, you know, running free to do their business wherever they want. Um, we have to have a little bit of control in our fields and in our any of our packing facilities. Um, as far as wildlife is, is concerned, you know, can't stop it. I mean, it's unavoidable. They're out there. Um, again, we're looking for mitigation. Uh, we're not looking for elimination. It's impossible. So, you know, we just look for making sure that we harvest. Um, before we harvest, we scout for any kind of damage or droppings, um, and we want to use deterrents in the field. It could be as simple as a, you know, scarecrow, a pie tin, an 80 CD collection, um, you know, a tomato steak with, uh, with um, you know, a, a feed bag on it, um, anything that would be, can be used as a deterrent. We're looking for pest control. So anywhere we have our packaging, as we talked about, we want to implement pest control. Uh, we want to deter their presence. We set out traps, we create a map, and we monitor and record any type of activity. A couple of different ways that we do that, sticky traps. 
um, the tin cats, and then as everybody's kind of familiar, the bait traps. What do I mean by a rodent map? It's a requirement of the standard. All we do is put together a facility overview map like this. We show where our pest traps are and we have satisfied the standard. A few of the other examples of pest control devices, you know, you can use any of these. Um, you know, the main thing is that we're not placing them above our product. So um, we just want to make sure that as we capture, um, you know, insects in these types of traps that they don't and can't fall, pieces and parts can't get zapped into our product and or fall, you know, fall off of our sticky paper or if anybody has ever used one of the fly traps with the uh, solution in it, you don't want that anywhere near you and or your product. It's pretty smelly. Uh, they, you, it's an attractant, um, obviously, and you wouldn't want that um, letting loose on, on your crop or yourself. Talk about real quick clean versus sanitized. Um, you know, clean, um, if it's not clean, it can't be sanitized, so clean need to use potable water. That's where that source, potable water source comes in. We wanna use, you know, a mild safe detergent, not anything that's gonna be really smelly. Um, and we wanna use scrub brushes if we have to, and we wanna remove that dirt and debris. And then we wanna sanitize. So, you know, a couple different products that we can use to, to clean and sanitize. It has to be approved for food grade. You'd be surprised at how many times I go to a farm, just happened again this morning. You know, I picked up their bleach and it's for laundry. So it's not approved for that food grade or food contact surface. We wanna follow the manufacturer's label instructions. We wanna use the proper concentration. Um, if we're mixing or reusing water, we have to test for our efficacy. And then if we're, if we're testing with test strips, we have to log our results. Couple examples of some, you know, some real uh, food grade food safe uh, cleaners. Um, Simple Green puts out Crystal, which is a, uh, you know, a food service grade and anything that's natural or unscented, clear um, and approved for food use. A few of the sanitizers that are real typical, um, Clorox, germicidal bleach. Um, you know, we check the EPA registration number to make sure that it's for Food contact surfaces, um, and if we're using it as a wash um, and rinse for fruit and vegetables, making sure that um, it's in, uh, intended for that. Alpet D2 is, um, is an alcohol-based sanitizer. And Sanidate, if we're talking about organic, lots of our organic farmers use that because it's an OMRI-approved um, product. This is periacetic acid. I like it because you don't have to mess with pH readings. Um, it doesn't leave um, a, a smell or a taste or any type of residual on your product. Um, so I, I use, you know, when I was farming and, and we had our pack house, I always use Sanidate 5.0. Food contact surfaces, you know, when we talk about food contact surfaces, cleaning and sanitizing, you know, that's anything that comes in contact with your product. So it's hands, knives, snips, pack tables, harvest bins, conveyor belts, trucks, and trailer beds. Oftentimes we forget about that last piece. Um, and oftentimes they go out to farms and they have the farm truck and they have, you know, the back of it full with, you know, empty soda cans and empty oil cans, and empty hydraulic fluid and spare tires and drip tape. And, you know, then on top of that, they're putting, you know, they're putting fresh produce. So um, you know, when we're talking about food contact surface, the truck and trailer beds on the farms are also food contact, real important. Um, toilets and hand washing, you'd be surprised. Um, I, I have to go over this, but there are many farms that don't have toilet and hand washing facilities on site. Um, you know, so the require, the standard requires that we have bathrooms that are easily accessible, appropriate to the number of people we have that they're clean, well-stocked, that we have logs to show that they're being clean and that we have signage posted for making sure that we use the toilet instead of the woods, that we're, you know, that we're putting the toilet paper in the toilet instead of on the, on the back of a toilet. Um, some of our cultures um, and some of our, um, our H2A workers come from regions where they don't put the toilet paper in the toilet. So um, just making sure that we go through that health and hygiene with our employees. And then hand washing, um, again, be really surprised at how often 
um, people will, you know, go up and do this and no soap and wipe them on their pants and off they go. Um, we often do the black light to show, um, you know, we challenge people to go into the bathroom, wash their hands, come back out, put their hands under the black light. And, you know, people are amazed at how much is still left on their hands. So uh, proper hand washing. Some examples of, you know, facilities. So, you know, this is, <laughs> this is one of my farms where his wife is sick and tired of everybody going into the house. So she made him build one outside. Um, so, you know, this is an example and a, and a portageon, you know, either is acceptable. And if you're within a quarter mile and want to use your home bathroom, that's totally acceptable. Hand washing, uh, you know, it can be as simple as this is an, is an old, um, you know, laundry detergent container that's been cleaned and sanitized. We put potable water in it. We go to the Dollar General, we pick up, you know, toilet paper, um, paper towel holder. Um, we pick up paper towels, some hand soap, a five gallon bucket to catch our gray water. And, you know, you can use pallets or any type of table that you want. As long as we have this set up, it can, you know, cost you a few dollars um, or you can recondition lots of things on the farm. So we get quite creative. Uh, this picture on the right, um, he uses a lot of H2A workers. It's a really big blackberry farm up in, uh, in the Greenville area, Spartanburg area. Um, it was taking too long for 15 people to wash their hands to go out into the field. So he, you know, he built this. Um, so lots of creativity on the farms. It's one of the things I always, I always love is, you know, a lot of the farms will take some of these ideas and just really go to town with it. Um, and then I get to use them in my presentations. It's fun. So, you know, the other thing is making sure that we have good field and harvest practices. So we don't want to be dropping, I mean, harvesting dropped or rotten produce, you know, obviously if it's, if it's dropped or it's rotten, we have bacteria. Um, we don't want to set the harvest bucket in direct contact with the ground. Uh, we don't want to eat or drink in the field. Um, we don't want to lay or sit in the fields, but we do want to keep the produce covered after harvest in field storage and in transport. We do want to harvest at the commodity peak. Uh, we want to avoid wet weather harvest. We know what happens then. Um, our product is not so great after we do that. We want to use sharp tools, avoid contact with the ground, and we want to harvest often. So. This is me on our farm. I'm on the top of that. Um, we used to use this uh, truck for our, our harvest truck. And so everything was on the inside. We had all of our harvest containers in there. We had all of our tools in there. Um, we clean and sanitize everything at the end of the day and then turn that truck around um, right first thing in the morning. You know, sometimes we started at 5.30. Uh, when they, the crew came in, we would jump in and, and off we went. So. Uh, lots of ways, and that, that's what's kind of really cool with being able to help a lot of my farms. I have, you know, a farming background, I have a food safety background, I have, you know, a sustainable food and farming background, so I can kind of help all the way around. Waste management, have to have a plan, so a lot of times people will be like, okay, what about clutter? I have lots of clutter. Um, you know, I don't care about the clutter, I care about the garbage. So as long as the clutter is not within any of our areas of production, um, I'm not too worried about it. Just need to have, you know, waste management. Same thing for tools, buildings, storage and equipment. We wanna keep it clean and organized, dry and protected. We want our equipment maintained to prevent any leaks in the field. We wanna make sure that things are clean and sanitized. Um, and then we want to make sure that there's no broken taillights, headlights, that sort of thing on our tractors. Transport, like I said, final piece, a lot of people forget about it. Um, you know, this is an area where we want to keep things clean and sanitized. We want to keep free of allergens or odors. If we have cool, that's even better. Uh, the supply chain, you know, obviously, if we keep a cold supply chain from start to finish, our product lasts longer. Um, obviously covered is best. If you don't have cool, it is what it is. We do, we work with what we have. And then we would wanna make sure that we have good maintenance on the, on the trucks. We also have to think about allergens. You know, do you have any on the farm? If you have them on the farm, not a problem. We just need to make sure that we have separated storage, no mixed use food contact surfaces. They have to be properly labeled. We have to have allergy only signage and we have to have separate, uh, separated 
transport. So when we're talking about the big eight, um, soon to be big nine with the addition of sesame, um, some of the things that I see on the farms, you know, especially in my low country, uh, you know, the, the guys have um, fish and seafood um, and we'll transport produce on the same trucks. So we have to be careful. Um, a lot of my farms are diversified, so they will have eggs. Um, we talked about fish, uh, tree nuts, you know, especially pecans, any kind of um, peanuts, um, just making sure if they're on the farm that we, um, you know, that we keep things separated. So that is a really big way over the top overview of, you know, what's gap, uh, what does it cost, why do we do it? you know, what's involved in it, what are the big areas that we're going to focus on when we're going to start putting together that food safety plan. Um, that's, you know, about 45 minutes of, uh, of what usually takes a few hours to get across. Um, so if you're interested in audit, um, if, you want, if you want more questions answered regarding audit, um, happy to help out. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in going to audit and you want to use our technical assistance services and schedule a one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, you can join CFSA. It's a $40 a year membership. And basically after the membership um, of $40 a year, all of our services are free. There's tons of services that we offer. Um, and, and prices never to be a barrier to our services. So if you cannot, um, you know, af afford the $40 and you, you can only afford something or nothing, that doesn't mean that we aren't gonna help you. That means we absolutely are gonna jump in and help any way we can. Um, but all of our, um, all of our, uh, our membership fees go back into supporting, supporting our members. So I'm going to touch real uh, quickly on organic, um, and then I believe that we have some uh, farmer partners who are going to talk about uh, from GAP to um, certification and from organic to certification. And then our organic expert, uh, Mark, Mark Dempsey, uh, I believe is going to jump in a little after seven o'clock, and he'll just kind of be available to help answer any questions if you have them. So um, if you're thinking about organic, you know, couple of questions most people ask are, you know, who's, who, who's going to help me? Um, how much is this going to cost? Is it complicated? How long is it going to take? And, you know, why would I? What, what am I going to get out of it? So, you know, NOP, the National Organic Program, that's um, USDA. It's the regulatory agency that develops and enforces the national standards for organically produced agricultural products sold in the United States. Um, you know, CFSA Consulting Services, we offer a ton of services when it comes to this. Um, you know, we have consulting services through uh, Mark Dempsey, who will help write conservation plans, who can answer questions, who can help with all of the forms and the applications, um, and helps the farmers who are, are either conventional and looking to transition or just starting out. So we provide basic information on the different certifying agents that work in both North and South Carolina um, and abroad. Um, there are there, the certifying agents themselves, um, that's kind of its own, its own beast. And I'll get into some of the Q&A on this in a minute. Um, but Q&A on the USDA's National Organic Program, um, regulations that will help you um, that are relevant to your operation, um, guidance on the appropriate record keeping systems and farm maps that are required, and then a careful review of your records and certification application materials prior to submittal to that certifying agent. So if you're transitioning, you're going to need that CAP plan, which is a conservation activity plan. Um, it doesn't always have to, you don't always have to have that CAP plan, but that CAP plan pretty much gets you all the way through the process. So with CFSA, um, you know, technical assistance, we can help write your CAP 138 plan. So what's a CAP 138 plan? It's that conservation activity plan that supports that organic transition. Um, and it's basically your farm's ticket to address the site-specific natural resources needed. Um, and then can also, you can also use that to go through um, NRCS, which is the National Resource Conservation Service um, for some of their support, um, some reimbursements, some cost share options, um, some 
some different services that they offer. Um, and like I said, this cap pretty much provides the nuts and bolts of your organic system plan that you need for organic certification. Costs, uh, you know, this is a tough one. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna put out there that the reimbursement, and this was for, and I, I have to make a correction to this slide. This is for, or was for South Carolina. Um, they have changed the, the cost share program to be 50% of costs associated with USDA organic certification up to $500. Um, last year, um, South Carolina said, whoa, wait a minute, you know, how do you, well, they're knocking it down from 75% and 750 max to this 500. We're going to contribute that 25% and keep it 750. And they did so through last year. So um, I, I talked to Mark actually on the way and he'll, when he joins us, he may be able to clear the air on this, but we're not certain that that same funder is going to do the same thing for 2022. And I apologize, it's been a crazy week. I've not had the opportunity to, to verify whether that program in South Carolina alone um, is still ongoing. So if we're looking at North Carolina and other states, it is 50% and $500. So I will make that correction and, and send it out to, to Nikki. So what is this cost share program? It's a reimbursement based program. Um, you must first successfully become certified to, in order to qualify. You either receive the re reimbursement. Um, in order to receive it, you would have to submit um, an application, a current W-9, um, all the, uh, the receipts showing all the costs incurred for certification and your certificate. So is it complicated? Yeah, I mean, it can be. Um, but there's help um, and, and, you know, again, that technical assistance to get you through. So you would need to develop and um, implement your organic system plan. You need to select the USDA accredited certifying agent and submit your application and fees. Um, once all those requirements are met, you're ready for your on-farm inspection. So usually when you get your certifying agent, they are, are the certifier and the inspector or have an in-house inspector. They come out to the farm, they complete the inspection, um, they send the report to, you know, typically within uh, the certifying agent reviews it um, and reviews that inspection report and then either approves or denies. First time applicants, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Mark talk a little bit about this. Um, you know, we talked on the way here, uh, on the way to, um, to where I'm at, uh, you know, good rule of thumb is you know if you have about two acres, um, you're looking at about a thousand dollars, and by the time that your cost or reimbursement comes into play, you're about five hundred dollars out of pocket. How long will it take? Um, you know if you're making a transition, in order for the land to be eligible for certification, it, it must not have any of the prohibited substances applied for a period of three years. So once you make the decision to transition the land to organic production, you have to manage the land without the use of those prohibited substances for at least 36 months before any crops or other agricultural products produced from that land um, can be marketed as organic. So do you have to hold, take the whole farm and, 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 and you know, not produce anything for three years? No, you can do it in phases. Uh, one of the most important pieces of that is just making sure that on the pieces that you're transitioning, that you are keeping really good records of, um, you know, of any type of amendments that you are using and making sure that those amendments are not part of that prohibited substance list. So what, you know, you, you have a piece of land, it's been sitting, you know, it's dormant for the last 10 years and you can prove that, you can come right out of the gate. And, and basically, as long as you have some type of documentation that backs up that that land has not had any of those prohibited substances, you can start right out of the gate. So, you know, a couple, one of the questions is, you know, why would I go organic? Um, you know, obviously there's two markets. Um, there's conventional and there's organic. Uh, you are going to get a higher price point at markets and from buyers if you are organic versus conventional. 
Um, one of the things I used to like jump up and down about is our farm was sustainably run. Uh, so we used all OMRI approved products. We did not use synthetic pesticides or insecticides, um, but we didn't go through that certification piece. So, um, you know, it doesn't matter at market. It doesn't matter with your buyers. Everybody wants to promote local, but, you know, nine times out of 10, you're getting a conventional price or an organic. So um, just something to keep in mind, uh, you know, and then if we're looking at why are we doing it um, from an environmentally friendly standpoint, you know, we reduction in greenhouse gases, there's obviously less fuel, fossil fuel production. It's environmentally friendly. We don't have those synthetics I just talked about. Um, sustainable practices, um, less energy use, healthier soil, we're building soil health. Um, when we build soil health, we have more water conservation and water health um, and just improve uh, biodiversity. So it, it takes commitment. It takes maybe some new and different tools. It takes a really good understanding of soils. Um, it takes nutrient management. Uh, you'll need to uh, thoroughly understand the role of the soil's physical structure and its biology. Um, because two of the biggest challenge in transition from, you know, from conventional um, to, to organic is that learning the soil health. So, you know, weed control techniques, it's not going out there with Roundup and, you know, your nitrogen management. So it's not applying synthetic fertilizers. So, you know, cover crops, et cetera, crop rotations. So I put together, um, you know, a, a list of resources for you guys. Um, and, and I believe everybody's going to get a copy of this. So, um, you know, this is uh, some of the big players in organic um, and, and some of the, the references. We have a lot of great stuff on our website. Um, so if you take a look at this, um, there's even a, a video, the road to organic certification that um, USDA has on their website and that we've put, uh, put together with a few partners and it takes you from start to finish. And with that, I just wanted to say thanks for having me. And I believe we're gonna let our farmer partners jump on and, and talk. And I'm here to ask, answer any questions you may have um, either now or when we get finished. Thank you, Kim. I think what we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead with our farmers. Uh, Fantastic. And then we'll have the questions uh, all together for you all. And so if you have any questions, I see one already in the chat box. Go ahead and put those in the chat box and we'll make sure we come back to them uh, during the Q&A. So next, we're going to move right into our farmer uh, panel. And today we have with us uh, Patrick Brown from Brown Family Farms. Patrick is farming on land that his family has owned for generations in a small community called Hex Grove in southeastern Warren County, North Carolina. The farm was established uh, by uh, Mr. Brown's great-grandfather, Byron C. Brown, in 1865 and has been farmed by his father and his grandfather before him. The Browns have previously raised livestock, grown vegetables, grain, and tobacco. Uh, Brown Family Farm's mission is to help provide an alternative, holistic solution to customers naturally by processing and manufacturing carbon-neutral neutral plants like industrial hemp, natural herbs and organic vegetables. Brown's Farm is GAP certified. Uh, did, is Mr. Obi with us? I didn't see if I didn't see him in the thing. I wonder if you could unmute Mr. Obi if you're with us. All right, I'm on. All right, Hi, great. All right. We have with also Bernard Obi. He is a fifth generation farmer located in Roxborough on 32 acres of mostly woodlands, pasture and meadows with about five acres under cultivation. Obi is committed to building a healthy farm ecosystem using a no-till approach on remineralized, naturally enriched soil. A Bantu, and Mr. Obi, you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but a Bantu Farms is a, a certified organic farm and their mission is to cultivate food that achieves its gen uh, genetic potential for nutrition, healing, and flavor. So I hope I said your farm name correctly. A uh, Bonnie too. A uh, Bonnie too. Great, thank you. So I have a few prompt questions uh, that you all sent in as you registered that we would like to ask our farmers. And uh, but first, I'd like to give them the opportunity to just kind of 
uh, give us any information about their farm that may not have been in the bio uh, that they would like to share. And then we'll get to those questions. And like I said, if our attendees could put questions in the chat box, we'll make sure we get to those as well. So we'll start with uh, you, Mr. Obi. Well, thank you. Uh, I wanna uh, just say greetings, uh, peace, blessings to all the attendees and the folks who are tuning in. Uh, thank you for your interest, especially uh, on the organic side of agriculture. Um, so our farm uh, has been around for quite a while. It's, uh, you know, uh, more than a century and uh, have been some ups and downs, but, uh, you know, mostly what we're doing now is what the folks did back in the day in terms of taking care of the land and understanding that by doing so, uh, you know, the land would take care of them. So we have about 90 acres and uh, most of it is woodland, uh, something that is a big plus. We have 12 acres that's certified and, uh, you know, we maintain habitat for uh, pollinators, wildlife, and uh, just generally try to manage the land in a way that is a positive and a plus for, for for food, for people, for uh, the ecosystem. Uh, you know, we feel a responsibility for that. Our goal is to grow really strong food. Most of what is wrong with people is um, deficient food. This is my opinion, uh, you know, because I grew up in a time when folks lived to be a hundred. I can name several just right off the bat. You know, I'll let one suffice. You know, Mr. Pitt Jones, he farmed his farm, uh, one mule, you know, grew tobacco and his own food. He's a beautiful spirit. He lived to be 103 and his, he lived alone. His mind was clear until the very end. He went to register to vote at 103. You know, when folks asked him about coming back next year, he <laughs> reminded them, he said, well, I'm not gonna live forever. But, um, you know, that's what I'm accustomed to. He's one of a number of examples that I can cite. So uh, the food really does matter. Folks tell me that, uh, you know, we have this thing called the microbiome that's, you know, the number of uh, microbes is 10 times the number of cells that we have in our bodies that so we're covered in and out with microbes. And we're super, super duper concerned about them. And there are some that are dangerous, it's true, but most of them are beneficial to us. And in the soil in particular, the, uh, you know, these uh, natural organisms are our allies. So yeah, we seek to develop a stronger, closer relationship with nature so that we can bring food to people that is not just good and tasty and fresh and so on, but powerful in terms of what it offers for uh, nutritional requirements for the body. So I feel privileged to be able to uh, call, you know, myself a farmer and to walk in the path that, you know, started by my ancestors and so many people, uh, friends and neighbors and so on in this part of the world on a small scale, but very powerfully and um, I hope it's something that we can get back to, um, you know, as a community and as people, folks um, being close to each other, understanding the need for community in uh, sustaining themselves and each other, but also sustaining nature uh, for the sake of not just the present, but for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Obi. Mr. Brown. Thank you all for uh, allowing me to be a part of this um, awesome event today. Uh, my name is Patrick Brown. I'm a fourth generation farmer at Brown Family Farms. Um, as the introduction gentleman, Mr. Jeffers introduced us, we have a farm luckily in our family for over 165 years. And um, my job as a fourth generation farmer is to be a steward of the land that was already destined before I was born and to continue the farm practices and, <clears throat> excuse me, and the scalability of farm 
uh, for future generations. And we are so privileged to be able to do that since my father retired in 2003. Um, Farmer Obi, he focused so much on food and we feel the same about the types of food and what we grow and what we put into our bodies to be able to be a ministry for others in the community to promote health instead of feeding just hunger. We focus on mainly creating a way to provide a healthy food stability or traceability process from farm to table and be able to not only fulfill the ministry of our community, but also becoming GAP harmonized plus certified allows us to be able to put food on the commercial side to diversify our farm portfolio as much as possible to identify the ability to grow the food, but to also be able to sell it as well so that we can continue to focus on scalability of our farm and educating other young farmers like myself as uh, as the future proceeds. So we're just thrilled and honored to be a part of this program. Um, Harmonize Plus Gap has been great for us and given us opportunities to expand our business. And we continue to strive to uh, get an audit each and every year. We have one coming up next month. And Ms. Butts, who is actually is gonna be my uh, person of uh, making sure that all my books are in line and Carolina Farm Stewardship Program is one of the uh, best programs that we've ever been a part of when it comes to that. So we are excited and we thank you again for having us. Well, thank you both. And uh, we know it's planning time and it's still some light out. So we appreciate you taking the time to, to do this with us and share you, your all's knowledge. Uh, I failed to introduce myself in the beginning, but I'm Ray Jeffers. I work with Rafi as a uh, program manager on the policy team, as well as our expanded market access program with our Farmer or Color Network, and also a small producer myself. And so we'll get right into the questions. Um, first, we'd like you all to talk a little bit about, you know, why did you get certified? Um, how long did it take? And, um, you know, what did you need to get started? And we can start with you, Mr. Brown. So the first thing um, we found out was that in order to, I did some research and in order for us to advertise our, our food and to get in some of the databases that the commercial markets utilize to identify farms that are small like mine, um, are first to get a food safety plan and an audit system to show how we uh, harvest our food and how we handle our food. And when I found out doing my research through my extension agent, I found out that there was a program in the state of North Carolina that would, that would help farmers like myself prepare for those type audits. And uh, what I was able to do was get in contact with a uh, Carolina Farm Stewardship Program. And they um, assigned me to a person in a, in a position of Miss uh, Butts there. And I was able to have them visit the farm and look at some of the infrastructures and processes that we had already had in place. And they also helped uh, show us ways to improve those structures so that we can pass our audit. And it took us about, I would say two months to get uh, ready for our first audit, which was last year. And um, after we created our food safety plan and our, and our auditing books, we we're able to maintain our books for the 12 months up until our next audit, which it comes up next month. Uh, so that's basically how long it took us to get in line for that process. Thank you, Mr. Obi. Um, we got certified organic in 2015, I believe. And we wanted to do it because, uh, you know, um, you know, we were just interested in, um, you know, having not just our, uh, like word, but to have uh, an independent um, certifier to confirm that, you know, we were doing the things that we said that we were doing. Our, uh, you know, we wanted to, uh, you know, access markets that were, you know, where people were, uh, you know, very well informed and, um, you know, had very high standards and that, you know, willing to pay extra for, you know, premium food. Um, our motto and our guiding mission for um, 
the food that we create is, uh, you know, food as medicine. And um, so, yeah, we wanted someone uh, to sort of certify the fact that we were doing those things and so that we could offer it to people and they would have the confidence, not just of, you know, our word and, and uh, you know, our statements about our practice, but that, you know, that independent um, uh, source that would, would confirm that we were doing those things. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit about the impact um, that it has, uh, the certifications have for you as far as your sales or when you are marketing your products, uh, Mr. Obi? Yeah, um, it makes a difference there. You know, the there have just been so many uh, publicized issues of people who've been uh, negatively affected with the use of chemicals. And uh, I mean, everybody knows the, you know, the big uh, sort of headline kinds of issues. And, um, you know, we, we wanted to just let folks know that, you know, that's not what we're doing and you don't really have to take our word for it. And it, we've been received very well. Um, the more folks are informed about food and, the role that it plays in their well-being short and long term that of their families the more they're interested in what it is that we're doing so our following is growing um you know we're keeping our standards and uh you know we talk a lot with people their concerns their you know their fears and some of them with personal stories about injury and so on and just to help reassure them and um, so, yeah, our trajectory is uh, is upward. And uh, while we don't have, you know, access to some of the big, um, you know, wholesale buyers and so on like that, which suits us fine, uh, down on the ground where the people are, um, those folks are gaining more and more confidence in what it is that we're doing from their experience with our food. And uh, that's really what's most important to us because you know, our families eat that food too. And uh, so we want it to be strong uh, and we do everything we can to make sure that that's the case. Thank you. What about you, Mr. Brown? How, how has it impacted your sales or the markets you've been able to access? Yes, uh, by being uh, GAP uh, Harmonized Plus certified, it allows us to uh, be able to sell our produce to uh, a higher price point than traditional conventional. It gives us the ability to market our product uh, to some of the uh, restaurants uh, markets, as well as like schools and markets such as that, so that they can be able to market to their uh, customers as a healthier um, option for them, for their food and where it's being sourced. Um, so it gives us an opportunity to diversify our purchasing power uh, to be able to get into markets that we haven't been able to get in in the past. Great, thank you. We heard Kim talk a little bit about some of the infrastructure needs, be it hand washing stations, bathrooms, or so on. Um, how have you all been able to be creative with those or were they pretty big upfront costs? How were you able all to uh, be able to kind of handle those requirements, Mr. Brown? So with the hand washing tables, what I was able to do was purchase uh, a portable hand washing station. And I just incorporated that into my, uh, my pack house area. And then our restrooms, we have a, ho a house that's on the farm there, which is not far from our pack housing area. And we utilize that restroom for volunteers and people to help on the farm. So uh, as we grow and as the years go on, we will, and as we scale up, we want to add infrastructure to the area of our farm uh, to add restrooms to the pack house area as we expand that infrastructure. All right, Mr. Obi. Yeah, we use a uh, a vacant home as well that has uh, you know all the facilities and so on. We also have a portage on that uh, folks have access to. That's a 
little nearer. So the home is probably a mm, hundred yards from where we do most of, you know, washing, packing, and the porta john is, uh, you know, just of, I don't know, maybe fifty feet or so away. So uh, they're both right in the proximity, and so uh, that's worked for us. And that's uh, we don't have plans to to uh, change that system right now. Thank you. This question is for Mr. Obi. It comes in uh, more about the organic, uh, around the cost of organic pesticides or production price, um, production cost, uh, seed cost. How have you been able to adapt uh, with that compared to more conventional type uh, methods, um, you know, as far as your marketing, sale, your, um, you know, your sales? So, so yeah. Um, Seed is more expensive, fertilizers are more expensive. We don't use uh, pesticides, and so we, we don't have a need for it. And uh, so that's an area that we save. I think that's a consequence of the way that we relate to, you know, the land and to, you know, the plants that we're using, the seed and so on, I think is a little stronger when it didn't have a, you know, a chemical inundation so yeah, there are some expenses associated with it, but uh, we can get, you know, better pricing, and we have a loyal following. So we, um, you know, we're able to balance it in the end with that. The other part of it is that you know by, you know, uh, you know, growing food that we enjoy and that we can eat, uh, you know, that helps as well. Because everybody knows that the you know, food costs a lot and the stores is going, you know, higher and higher. The origins and so on of it are often in question and what's been done along the way, how long, how far away and all of that are questions that often go unanswered. I speak with produce managers and ask. So um, those are not monetary, but they are tangible uh, issues that that help us feel good about, you know, where we are with the return that we do get. Great, thank you. Our next question is more on the GAP certification side. So this is for you, Mr. Brown. As far as uh, when you get your certification applying for common products. So we know like, you know, if, you, if you're harvesting collars that day, your auditors there, it kind of goes for other products that are harvested similar to way collars are correct. And so how did you go about deciding products or how you know do you did you pick products like collars and and tailor that off to what else you're going to grow that's harvested similar or how did you make those decisions so basically on the day of your audit the auditor gives you the opportunities to select what types of uh, produce that you would like to uh, harvest to show how it should be properly harvested or you can um, you can act as if that is a vegetable that you're going to harvest um, and you could do it that way. It just all depends on the auditor. Um, as far as the way that we harvest various uh, vegetables, we, we harvest for market. So that's meaning that you would harvest based on the amount of bunches that you will fit in a particular box that you're going to market to the buyer. Usually when you have a, a farmer to buyer uh, business relationship, they would identify the way that they would like their, their produce to be stored or packaged. And then that way, the farmer would basically um, harvest in that particular way so that when it gets to the buyer, they may not necessarily have a food processing license. So that buyer may have to take that produce that they get from your farm and it may go directly to the shelf. Thank you. Uh, this question is for both of you all. At what point in your operation um, did you reach to say this was worth it? Let's go for that gap certification. Let's go for that organic certification. Um, and then uh, when you did, did you, were you able to utilize the uh, cost sharing programs, Mr. Brown? Yes, absolutely. Um, cost share programs in any uh, form of uh, support from local agencies, uh, whether it be USDA, FSA, um, NCRS, it's always important to utilize these programs because they are a benefit to the farmers. 
being able to have the opportunity for reimbursements, even though it sometimes does hurt us in a way that we have to put our money up front, but being able to get reimbursed up to 90% in some of these programs is so valid, vitally important. Um, farmers in the past and uh, previous generations, like say my grandfather, they didn't have those opportunities um, or the funding was that the cost share refunds weren't as much as they are now. So it's so it's so important to have that. And I, um, I pray that that continue to be a benefit to the farmers for, for years to come. Um, so for us, I would say that it's so important to um, have that type of support for small disenfranchised farms programs like ours uh, we are still considered a small farm in operation um, and for me it's just one of the things that is a must-have thank you mr obi i agree totally um you know the the trend seems to be you know for farms to get bigger and bigger and bigger and I can remember as a teenager, we were farming and the word coming down from USDA and you know the ag agents and so on was that you had to get bigger or you had to get out. You had to get big or get out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the emphasis was you know, on sort of the bigness. And I never really understood that. And uh, you know, I, um, I think there's, there's a uh, room and I think it's beneficial for all sides of producers from, uh, you know, the very small to the very large and that people will make their decisions about what meets their needs. And, you know, that's right and good uh, to give uh, consumers an opportunity to consider and to decide. But small operators need the kinds of support that often just goes to the big operators and so, yeah, that, that, that kind of support is critical and probably the smaller, the more critical it is. So I would, I'm grateful for the support that we've gotten in that, uh, in that area. And I hope it continues. And now they're cutting the percentages, but it's still beneficial and I'm really happy to see it. So I, I definitely agree with that. Great, thank you. Mr. Over, we had a, a question for you to come into the chat. Are the restaurants on, uh, in your area that buy organic uh, produce, have, do they have like a stamp on front of their restaurant for advertisement? Or, um, or how, do, how do they get to, how do you get your customers, I guess? How do you find those customers that are looking for organic? Yeah, so uh, we use signage. Um, we did sell to, uh, a few restaurants, most of them were folks that we knew or had a relationship with in some way, meaning, you know, not a blood relationship, but maybe a friendship or someone that, you know, we had an association with in another area of activity that, you know, started restaurants and so on. And we did support those folks to help them get started and so on like that. But most restaurants today are caught in a squeeze where, you know, they, you know, they're not, they're not really, I would say most of them uh, are not really looking for the highest quality of produce. They're looking for good produce that they can then put their skill on to make it taste good. And so those are not our prime customers. We don't sell wholesale. We, we sell uh, sort of high end retail. And uh, what we try to do is to you know, make it so good and so strong that people, you know, they have a, like, this is the best we've ever, we've had a, so many instances of feedback of that type where people really appreciate what it is that we're doing, but it's not really suitable for the restaurant business per se, except, you know, in, you know, exceptional kinds of situations. So we have given produce to restaurants to help them get started. Uh, you know, obviously we can't do that indefinitely, but um, in special cases, we make accommodation, but for the most part, we're not really, uh, most restaurants are not really looking for the type of approach that we have for their day-to-day -day operations because they have such thin margins that they have to respect to stay in business. 
I hope that answered that. Thank you. Okay, we've got three more questions so far. Uh, in about five minutes, I've got to get them in. So, Kim, we're going to bring you in this time, too, because we had a question earlier in the chat for you uh, asking about aeroponics, aquaponics, um, raised farms, uh, about them maybe being certified organic. Oh, all right. Well, I'm, I'm actually going to pass it off to Mark Dempsey for, for the uh, aquaponics and what have you. I mean, I, for certification for GAP, absolutely. Um, you know, I work with lots of um, hydroponic uh, farms and aquaponics. And, and, but as far as the organic goes, I know the regulations have changed a little bit. Um, it's been, been a little bit of a hot topic, especially for the hydroponics. So, Mark, could you jump in for us? Yeah, sure. Happy to field that question. Hey, y'all. I'm Mark Dempsey, who also works for Keep a Stay with Kim. Um, I hope y'all can hear me okay. I'm in a public space uh, with background noise. I apologize if they're there. But uh, the short answer to the question is that it, aeroponics, hydroponics, and legal ambiguity, let's just call it like this weird gray area where it went undecided when it was supposed to be decided upon by um, the governing board of the rule book, basically, which is the NOSB. And um, to be to the point, it simply depends on the certifier. Some certifiers allow it and are happy to certify hydroponic and aeroponic farms because it's not specifically prohibited to have that certified. And others are just simply ideologically like opposed to it. So they're like, we're not touching that. That shouldn't be certified. So it just depends and you would need to find a certifier willing to do that. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Our next question is, when is a good time to start looking at certification? Anybody want to tackle that one? Sure, I'll go for it. Um, you know, when you have that burn, that, um, you know, that kind of keeps you awake at night or you're walking about your place and you want to try to go to another level. Yeah, it's time to investigate and to see, you know, you know, if your interests and your de and desires match up with the requirements. You can do that investigation easy and quick. And then if it does, you can decide to go in. There is a lot of help and guidance in making it happen. It does take time as you know, has already been explained, but it's worth the time. And uh, getting to know the land that you're working in a personal, very personal kind of a way is always a plus for the farmer, whether you end up with certification or not. And uh, it'll benefit whatever it is that you're growing. The more intimate you are with that knowledge, um, the, the more you'll be able to do, the better you'll be able to do, in my opinion, whether or not you actually go through with uh, the certification. Thank you. And how long does the land have to uh, uh, stay fallow you know, before you can convert it to organic? Three years is, uh, you know, what Ms. Kim was saying earlier, and that's, uh, that is true. Uh, in our case, the land had been fallow for a while, a tragedy happened that took my father's life. And so between the time that he left and the time that I showed up, <clears throat> there was, uh, you know, multiple years, uh, but three years is the minimum. And they will ask you to, you know, confirm and verify that. Thank you. And we had a question uh, from someone from North Dakota about where do they go look to, to, to get GAP certified? Is it just the USDA office, Kim, or, or is it same in each state or? Yeah, so I would, I would you know, obviously I'm not sure um, in, in North Dakota, but um, you would start with your extension office. They would be able to point you in the direction um, a lot of times. Um, you know, extension offices will have somebody who has um, GAP training and can help the certification, or they can point in, um, point in the direction of maybe a consultant. All right. Well, thank you all um, for, like I said, giving your time to this evening to, for the betterment of all of our education, for all of our farmers uh, that are participating or people who are in like-minded spaces that are working with farmers. Uh, so we definitely appreciate your time and your expertise tonight. And I am going to turn it back over to Nikki. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Okay. Thank you, um, uh, Farmer Bernard and uh, 
and also Patrick for sharing and for Mark and Kim for jumping on. Um, I just want to make sure um, we're at 730, but I want to make sure there wasn't any uh, last questions for any of our um, folks. You guys are welcome to come off mute if you want to. Um, just any last questions. Um, and also a reminder that we are going to share these slides with you along with the, rec with the recording um, of the webinar following um, following the webinar with probably in the next 48 hours. So any last questions? All right. Well, um, oh. I think you're on mute. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. I, I just remember something that I would like to share with all of you. The very I'm doing some stuff with, with NASA, and there has been a new executive order, uh, a presidential that is the number is 13985. That is on a federal level on all the agencies that is to close the gap on a, and to bring a, a equality between all the minorities throughout. It's something very new. Please search from it. So it applies to all the industry. It's 13985. Thank you so much. It has been great. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Thank you. All right. Thank you. Alicia, can you share your screen, these last couple of slides? And there, I think there's a, a question in the chat about if, um, so this was just a general webinar. This doesn't really go towards any sort of certification. So we won't be sending out any, any certificates. Um, you would contact Kim or CFSA um, or another uh, association like that um, to actually take um, like a more fuller, a longer webinar. This was just sort of an overview to give people a taste of, of what's possible and what, what's necessary for food safety practices to answer your question. Um, also, just to, to end on this, if there's any more, um, if you have any uh, questions or, or anything that comes up, um, the emails of the Farmers of Color Network staff are um, on the slide here. Uh, Alicia Curry, who's our director, of, uh, Ray Jeffers, who you um, heard moderating, and myself. So please feel free to email us if any other questions come up. Um, and then finally, um, I, I will be sending out um, a survey, a link to a survey. So please fill out your post webinar survey evaluation. Um, please uh, just be honest, it's like six to seven questions. Um, the feedback is greatly appreciated. Um, we'll use it to inform you know, future programming, uh, our services, and also future webinars. Um, so look out for that link um, either here um, in the chat, or I'll, I, like I said, I'll be emailing it along with uh, the recording. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you all for joining us this evening and look out for our next um, our next in our, in our series of market readiness, probably in, I think at the month of June or July, it'll come out. So just be looking out for the, the next in the series and everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Thank you, Nikki. Good night. Good night. Thanks for your time, everyone. Have a good night.